Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight's uh, program is co-sponsored by the Institute of Politics at the, at the uh, Kennedy School and by the program uh, on constitutional government in the government department. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Katie Royfe, who is uh, a Harvard uh, graduate in the class of 1990 and who uh, just got her PhD six days ago from Princeton in English. <laughs> She's the author of the book, The Morning After, Sex, Fear, and Feminism on Campus, which has created much controversy, which we hope to prolong this evening. <laughs> and she's also the author of her uh, PhD dissertation, which is called The Writer and the Dream, Psychoanalysis and American Literature, 1940 to 1970. Now there's a real dissertation title for you. <laughs> and we're also very fortunate tonight uh, to have his uh, respondent to the uh, to the main speaker, Professor Barbara Johnson, who's a professor of English and comparative literature at uh, Harvard University, and she will address a few remarks after uh, 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 Dr. Royfe uh, uh, f finishes, and then we'll have plenty of time left for questions. So Katie Royfe. Thank you. Um, I'm very grateful to be here. I have to confess that when someone says Dr. Roy, I sort of look around for my father, who who's, is a doctor. Um, and I'm, I'm very grateful to have a chance to talk here. Um, I'm sorry if I sound like an aging jazz singer. That is because I'm losing my voice, but hopefully it will, it will, will stay with me. Um, what I'm going to do is introduce myself and lay out a few of the arguments in the book, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about my thoughts about the response to the book. And the reason I'm going to do this is not you know, to kind of give a personal media odyssey, but um, because I think that I sort of want to use myself as a case study you know, about how it is that we talk about ideas in this culture and, and to kind of look at what's going on in feminism in the context of the larger cultural issues. Um, and I'm going to try to talk briefly so that there's lots of room, time for questions and comments. So, get my water. Um, my grandmother lived in a world of manicures, hair salons, and no place to go in the morning. She shopped and played endless card games, the king and queen of hearts, spades, clubs, and diamonds absorbing all of her intellectual energy. She missed feminism, my mother told me, by only a few years. It would have saved her. So when I was very young, I thought of feminism as something like a train. You could catch and ride to someplace better. My grandmother missed it, but my mother caught it. I knew it was all about having your own work, before work meant anything to me but the sound of my mother's typewriter behind closed doors. In the 60s, my mother had written Up the Sandbox, an early feminist novel recounting the elaborate escape fantasies of a bored housewife. Feminism had a lot to do with my mother's own escapes. I knew that. So when I was growing up, I didn't spend a lot of time thinking about feminism. It was something assumed, something deep in my foundations. When I got to Harvard in the fall of 1986, all of that changed. I found something called feminism that was unfamiliar to me. The feminism around me in classrooms, conversations, and student journals was not the feminism I grew up with. The take back the night marches and the sexual harassment peer counseling groups were alien, and even sometimes at odds with what I thought feminism was. All of a sudden, feminism meant being angry at men looking at you on the street and writing about the, quote, quote colonialist appropriation of female discourse. It meant interpreting Andrew Marvell's To His Coy Mistress, which was one of my favorite poems of seduction, beginning with the lines, had we but world enough in time, this coyness lady were no crime, as a poem about date rape and verbal coercion. At Harvard, and later at graduate school in English literature at Princeton, I was surprised at how many things there were not to say, at the arguments and assertions that could not be made, 
lines that could not be crossed, taboos that could not be broken. The feminists around me had created their own rigid orthodoxy. You couldn't question the existence of a rape epidemic on American campuses. You couldn't suggest that the fascination with sexual harassment had to do with more than just sexual harassment. You couldn't say that Alice Walker was just a bad writer, and the list of couldn'ts went on and on. Listening to feminist conversations in and out of class, I was surprised at how fenced in they were, at how little territory there was that could actually be disputed. I remember standing outside of the Adams House dining hall looking at a purple poster with bold print saying, one in four women will be the victim of rape or attempted rape between the ages of 14 and 21. <clears throat> one in four. I remember thinking to myself that if I was really standing in the middle of an epidemic, if 25% of my women friends were really being raped, wouldn't I know it? The answer is not that there is a conspiracy of silence, but that measuring rape is not as straightforward as it seems. Now I know that 73% of the women classified as rape victims in that famous one in four survey did not think that what had happened to them was rape. Now I know that one of the questions asked to get that number was, have you had sex with a man when you didn't want to because he gave you drugs or alcohol? And if you said yes to that vague and I think offensively worded question, then that counted as rape. But at the time, no one was publicly questioning these rape figures. They were part of the new bedroom politics that had entered the university. Fighting against date rape and sexual harassment seemed to unite and inspire the feminists around me. Everything was cut and dried. It was feminists against the backlash, us against them, and increasingly, I was them. As I see it, there are more than two sides to any issue. And the feminists are closer to their backlash than they like to think. The image that emerges from feminist preoccupations with issues like rape and sexual harassment is that of women as victims, offended by a professor's dirty joke, verbally pressured into sex by peers. This image of a delicate woman bears a striking resemblance to that 50s ideal my mother and the other women of her generation fought so hard to get away from. They didn't like her passivity, her wide-eyed innocence. They didn't like the fact that she was perpetually offended by sexual innuendo. She represented personal, social, and intellectual possibilities collapsed. And they worked and marched, shouted and wrote to make her irrelevant for their daughters. But here she is again with her pure intentions and her wide eyes. Only this time it is the feminists themselves who are breathing new life into her. The first piece I wrote on this subject was an op-ed for the New York Times in November of 1991. And in it I compared the standard American College Health Association pamphlets, which are distributed to freshmen across the country during their first weeks at college, to a Victorian guide to conduct for, written for young ladies in the 1850s. And the American College Health Association pamphlet had two columns. One said men, and the other said women. And the men column advised men. It said, and I'm quoting, your desires may be beyond your control, but your actions are within your control. And the women column advised its delicate readers, and I am quoting here, communicate your limits clearly. If someone starts to offend you, Tell them firmly and early. The Victorian guide similarly warned, quote, never join in any rude plays that will subject you to being kissed or handled in any way by gentlemen. Do not suffer your hand to be held or squeezed without showing it displeases you by instantly withdrawing it. I pointed out in this piece that both the American College Health Association pamphlets and their Victorian counterparts are clearly designed to protect women from the insatiable force of male desire. We have been hearing about this for centuries. He is still nearly uncontrollable. She is still the one drawing lines. The assumptions embedded in these images are our grandmother's assumptions. Men want sex, women don't. I argued in this piece that in emphasizing this struggle, him pushing, her resisting, 
The movement against date rape recycles and promotes an old model of sexuality. All men are potential rapists, and all women are always about to be violated. I also argued against expanding definitions of rape to include things like verbal coercion. That's classified as pressure or manipulation, not including threats of force, or explicit consent. And that means that you need a yes. It's not no means no is not enough. You actually need, as one pamphlet says, quote, a clear, sober yes. Now, these definitions of rape, I think, are based on an assumption of female passivity. By viewing rape as encompassing more than the use of physical force or the threat of physical force, rape crisis feminists reinforce traditional views about the fragility of the female will. The idea that women can't withstand verbal or emotional pressure infantilizes them. The suggestion lurking behind this definition of rape is that men are not just physically, but intellectually and emotionally more powerful than women. Now, a manner's guide from 1848 warns young women, quote, the more attractive his exterior, the more dangerous he is as a companion to young girls. And the more likely he is to dazzle and bewilder her mind. He can, with a subtlety almost beyond her powers of detection, change her ordinary views of things, confuse her judgments, and destroy her rational confidence in the discriminating powers of her own mind, end quote. So, this fear of verbal coercion does not have its origins in modern feminism. The idea that young girls will be swayed, their judgments overturned, their minds dazzled and bewildered by the sheer force of masculine logic has been included in the date rape pamphlets they've been writing for more than a century. Universities have also become so saturated with the idea of sexual harassment that the phrase no longer applies to extreme of human behavior. Now, Susan Torres of the SHARE program at Princeton announced into a microphone at a Take Back the Night March that 88% of Princeton's female students had experienced some form of sexual harassment. Catherine McKinnon writes, only 7.8% of women in the United States are not sexually assaulted or harassed in their lifetimes. Now, what is going on? Um, but once the cat, you cast the net so wide as to include everyone's everyday experience, identifying sexual harassment becomes a way of interpreting the sexual texture of daily life instead of isolating individual events. In an essay attempting to profile the quintessential sexual harasser, two feminists warn in conclusion and in all seriousness, quote, the harasser is similar, perhaps disturbingly so, to the average man. Now, as one peruses guidelines on sexual harassment, it's pretty clear where the average man comes in because like most common definitions of sexual harassment, Princeton's definition includes, quote, leering and ogling, I never know how to say this word, ogling, whistling, sexual innuendo, and other suggestive or offensive or derogatory comments, jokes, or humor about sex. It also states, and this is sort of intriguing, um, quote, sexual harassment may result from a conscious or unconscious action. Now, McKinnon's statistic also includes obscene phone calls as sexual harassment. Um, now, these definitions of sexual harassment, and I'm referring back to you know, including leering, ogling, and dirty jokes, um, sterilize the environment. They propose classrooms and offices that are cleaner than Sesame Street or Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. Like the rhetoric about date rape, this extreme inclusiveness also forces women into old roles. What message are we sending if we say we want to be equals? We want to be doctors and lawyers, professors, editors, bankers, and congresswomen, but if you tell a dirty joke, we're going to burst into tears. With these expansive definitions of sexual harassment, sex itself gets pushed into a dark, seamy male domain. I think we're doing female children a disservice when we teach them, as young as five, that they have a special sexual vulnerability that if a boy on their school bus uses naughty language, then that is sexual harassment, that they can't take care of it themselves, that they should call the teacher. So um, that's, that's my quick overview of the book. Um, it's not a scientific survey measuring the immeasurable with statistical certainty. It's not a comprehensive encyclopedic sociological analysis. 
I am not a camera to invert Christopher Isherwood's famous narrative metaphor. I cannot offer the objective truth unfiltered through my own opinion. I've written only what I see, limited, personal, but entirely real. I have written my impressions. The book came out of frustration, out of anger, out of the names I've been called, out of all the times I didn't feel like I could say something because it might offend the current feminist sensibility. But there's something else, my grandmother and her card games, her hands turning over card after card, memorizing numbers. It is out of the deep belief that some feminisms are better than others that I've written this book. But something strange happens when a book enters the cartoon world of the media. After the book came out, I would read descriptions of myself as, quote, a neoconservative, an anti-feminist, part of the backlash against women, and even in Newsweek, the Clarence Thomas of women. <laughs> yes, it's true. And from, from the outraged descriptions of my book, you would think that I was actually saying things that no one who is not behind bars would say. You would think that I was saying rape does not exist. It sometimes seems to me that when people see words like rape or sexual harassment, red lights flash and alarms go off in their heads and they forget how to read. In saying that we should not hinge our identity as women on the idea of being sexually vulnerable and victimized, I am certainly not saying that women are never victims. But it wasn't just the media. Um, I was the Clarence Thomas of women in universities, too. After I wrote the first um, short piece in the New York Times, I was living in Princeton at the time, um, there was a group of graduate students in my classes who, who then decided that they couldn't talk to me or look at me. This is even in class. Um, they circulated and posted a petition all over class denouncing me, saying that I, quote, did not understand the extent to which gender, race, and class had radically been given voice in the academy, even though the piece I wrote had nothing to do with race or class. Written in the collective we, the petition also condemned the fact that I had mentioned Henry James as a sort of sign of my reactionary views. Now, this, P, this letter was also signed um, not just by graduate students, but also by, fa by faculty members, and kind of posted up over the, over the department and over the university. And um, Elaine Showalter, who was the chairman of the English department, had to call a meeting because classes couldn't actually go on because there was too much antagonism and people weren't speaking to each other. Now, um, I bring this up. Uh, I bring this up because as I, you know, am thinking about living and working in universities, I think we have to try to understand the mechanisms of intellectual taboos. I think it's important to understand why Neil Gilbert, who teaches at Berkeley, and he's the sociologist who first criticized that one in four statistic, and why it is that he has picketers outside of his classrooms with, th with signs that say, kill Neil Gilbert, and cut it out or cut it off. I also want to try to understand why students at Brown heckled Camille Paglia, making it all but impossible for her to finish a sentence. Why a professor at a West Coast university tells me he feels like he can't carry my book around campus. And for that matter, why is it that there are books that we feel like we can't carry around campus? Somehow we've reached a point in American universities where books themselves are considered dangerous. Ideas are considered dangerous. A point where there are things you are simply not supposed to say, think, or read. As I'm emerging from this long, strenuous effort to communicate that's lasted for months and months and what seems like years and years, the issue I most want to discuss is why these issues are so hard to discuss. The cliché about the war between the sexes has, like all clichés, its grain of truth. This war has its propaganda and its blind patriotism. When the maps and alliances and battle lines are drawn, loyalties pledged, sides declared, all ambiguities, doubts, and subtleties seem to disappear. This is a war of absolutes. It often seems when we stray into the world of sexual politics, every gesture is exaggerated, every conflict magnified. Our conversations so easily turn into arguments. Thoughts become polemics. Pulses race. Passions rise. Everything takes place in an atmosphere of high drama and courtroom spectacle. 
A penis is found next to a highway, and in every living room is a televised testimony about date rape from a woman with a gray dot over her face. Last September, a small progressive college called Antioch was catapulted to national attention by its extraordinary code of sexual conduct. As most people know, this code requires spoken permission for every stage of the sexual act. Intimate acts must be punctuated by questions like, can I kiss you? Can I unbutton your shirt? And so forth. And this is every time you have sex with somebody. Um, <laughs> so, the reason this code was applauded, condemned, discussed, and marveled at on television, on the front page of the New York Times, and in newspapers and magazines all over the world was not so much because it matters what a small group of students in Ohio do on a Friday night, but because the Antioch rules articulated the more diffuse attitudes about sexuality that had been floating around the culture at large brings to mind Joan Didion's quote about the women's movement over 20 years ago. She said, the movement is no longer a cause, but a symptom. And with their strange rules, the students and administrators at Antioch described something for us. They gave us a way to talk about how entwined sex and violence have become in our minds. They told us what we already know. We are a culture infatuated with consent. Now, a well-known feminist lectures all over America and Britain on, quote, how to make consent sexy. But how sexy consent is or isn't or can be is not the point. The Antioch Code of Conduct represents a sort of Orwellian nightmare of cameras in the bedroom. The Antioch rules hold a mirror to our stranger preoccupations. They show us reflected in its crudest form our desperate wish for rules about sex. The irony is that along with the rise in rules comes a decline in responsibility. In the pages of my book devoted to the idea of women taking responsibility for their actions, I am writing against the grain. And every now and then I kind of li I listen to myself and I feel like I'm, I'm sort of this curmudgeonly old white-haired man, you know, with all this talk about taking responsibility for your actions. But I really think that this is important if we're going to understand um, what's going on in feminism. Moral and legal responsibility are not in vogue for anybody these days. It was never our fault or our responsibility. It is always low self-esteem or social oppression or our family or patterns of abuse. If we cannot trust ourselves to be responsible, we have to rely on courts and on ever more elaborate codes of conduct. Once the individual is not held accountable for his or her behavior, it makes a certain amount of sense that we should look to new and stringent rules of sexual conduct to keep order. In a twisted and paradoxical way, the preoccupation with sexual rules represents an almost utopian faith in our ability to create a safe sexual world. Like the Antioch rules, our intense concern with definitions of sexual harassment over the past few years demonstrates a deep felt desire for and belief in a neat separation between sex and danger. In this time of sexual suspicion, changing roles and disease, we seem to believe that somewhere out there is an instruction manual, a potent mixture of law and etiquette that will tell us how to lead our sexual lives. But the desire to regulate sex is not confined to what is appropriate to say to an office mate or what must be whispered at intimate moments. Even the imagination is expected to stoop before rules about sex and gender. In his latest thriller, Disclosure, Michael Crichton strayed from the brittle and familiar images of male aggressors and female victims. As most people know, he tells a story of a sexy female boss who makes a pass at a male employee. He resists, and then she presses charges of sexual harassment against him, and everyone believes her because she's a woman. Unrealistic was the cry raised by many critics. And they were right, of course. Crichton's plot does not unfold along the lines of the classic sexual harassment case. But what his critics seem to have forgotten is that disclosure is a novel, a work of fiction. Michael Crichton has no obligation to what is euphemistically called realism and is actually something a lot more like political acceptability. When he wrote Jurassic Park, no one complained, dinosaurs don't really roam the earth. <laughs> but but treading on the delicate ground of gender relations, Crichton does not have that same kind of literary freedom. 
And a critic at the Los Angeles Times complained that she felt as if Crichton were cutting ahead of a line that women have been waiting in for a long time. Now, what she, what she was articulating, I think, with this strange image was her sense that Crichton was somehow breaking the rules of the victim game. I think it's dangerous to judge a book, any book, from supermarket thrillers to Ulysses on how politically acceptable it is. As countless writers and theorists from Horace to Shelley have written, art is supposed to give us the familiar made new, not offer us what we already know warmed over. But what sparked the ire of Crichton's critics from the Los Angeles Times to the New York Times was precisely his desire to imagine something beyond the mundane black and white newsprint of ordinary experience. Like Crichton's dinosaurs, his characters crash through the stereotypes we seem to be so enthralled by. He was suggesting that sometimes women want sex and sometimes men don't. That men are not guilty simply because they are men, and women are not beyond reproach simply because they are women. Louis Menand expressed a similar sentiment in a very eloquent essay in The New Yorker. He wrote, and this is a quote, we have fallen into the belief that morality can be ascribed to groups, but groups cannot be moral or immoral. Women are no more or less moral than men, and the city of Los Angeles is not more or less moral than inner city youth. Morality is an attribute only of persons, end quote. Now, although these seem to be simple and logical statements, we've actually reached a point in public discussion where the idea that one group is not more morally pure than another group cannot be taken for granted. In the current political atmosphere, common sense statements like Menands have been transformed into controversy and revelation. The idea that who we are comes entirely from what group we belong to is incredibly powerful, especially on college campuses. The University of Maryland, feminist students posted lists around the campus, um, and they were randomly selected names of men from the freshman Facebook, or whatever their equivalent is, under the heading, these men are potential rapists. Now, what alarms me most about what I would call zookeeper feminism, where um, all men are beasts, and what we have to do is invent the right cage to keep them in, um, is that actually it ends up trapping all of us into this group identity. And you know, mainstream feminism is sort of filled with this, examples of this way of thinking. You know, we have Naomi Wolf say, men make women anorexic, you know, things like that. We also have Catherine McKinnon saying, all women are silenced. And if you don't feel silenced, if you don't feel offended by Playboy, if you don't feel like you are living in a constant state of violence and intimidation by men, then you've been brainwashed. Now, even though Catherine McKinnon is not arguing that this is biologically determined, her sense of what is male experience and what is female experience in this society is so rigid that there's really no place for independence of thought or experience. Susan Brown Miller wrote in her best-selling book, Against Our Will, this is a quote, from prehistoric times to the present, I believe rape has played a critical function it is nothing more or less than a conscious process of intimidation by which all men keep all women in a state of fear. And you know, I feel like you've got to ask, where does she get that all? To me, the single thing that is most disturbing about the scramble for victim status is this idea that all men are X and all women are Y. And it, it is that it doesn't leave space for us to think and act as individuals. So the question becomes, how have we arrived at a place where banal assertions like all men are not potential rapists are worth hundreds and hundreds of letters to an author? The answer seems to me that as a culture, we have become astonishingly intolerant of dissent. I don't use words like dissent easily. To me, the word dissent seems like something dragged down from the attic still dusty from the 1930s and harsh exchanges about Trotsky and Stalin in New York leftist circles. But having spent months trying to communicate, I am convinced that we have to start thinking about dissent again. Of course, tolerating dissent does not mean welcoming every idea with open arms like a hypocritical hostess. Tolerating dissent simply means that we sit with foreign ideas the way we might with foreign people, long enough to hold a conversation, 
long enough for the differences of opinion between us to rise and expand fully clarified and articulated. Tolerating dissent is allowing for the give and take, push and pull of intellectual conflict. It is the willing suspension of disbelief in order to allow ideas that are not our own to sharpen our perception. Now, I've sat through a few discussions with very prominent feminists where tolerating dissent appears to mean nothing more than forcing agreement. And there's one vivid instance I can think of um, that's a sort of perfect exemplum of this principle. And that was on a British BBC radio show called The Women's Hour. There were five of us sitting around a large round table. And the majority would not permit differences of opinion to form and surface when true differences of opinion threatened to puncture the surface of placid conversation, they would loudly declare agreement and lapse into the bland generalizations of consensus. And it was actually very comic. I, I would begin, and now can say this with a little perspective, um, I would begin a sentence saying, I am alarmed by the current feminist trend, and before I could finish, a well -known, the well-known feminist artist at the table said, Katie, you shouldn't use words like alarmed to talk about feminism, that's terrible. And then the well-known British and American feminist academics agreed, oh, no, 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 you really shouldn't use words like alarmed. That's totally unacceptable. And, and, I'm not, and I'm, this is absolutely what happened. And having agreed amongst themselves that I shouldn't use the word alarmed, they never got around to letting me finish my sentence. Now, in that setting, the toleration of dissent begins to seem more like something that would be produced by George Orwell's Ministry of Truth. Most of us think about the free expression of ideas as desirable, at least in theory. For many Americans, dissent evokes a grand democratic tradition. The enthusiasms born at the wooden desks of fifth grade classrooms where we memorize the Declaration of Independence. Freedom of expression is part of our abstract idea of what America is. The toleration of dissent is part of what we fight wars for and what the American flag means when we plant it on the moon. In practice, though, it doesn't come as naturally. Today's intolerance of dissent is clever and protean. It takes different forms. Sometimes it's not so subtle. It's Gloria Steinem snapping, we don't give a shit about what she thinks, in a feminist forum when someone asked her about Camille Paglia. It's heckling a speaker as she's trying to give a speech. It's talking with absolute confidence about the content of a book without ever having read it. But sometimes our intolerance is more subtle. It animates phrases like, you are not living in the real world. Banishing someone from the real world offers a way to dismiss them without having to respond to the substance of their argument. Now, of course, one can infinitely divide the world into parts. Suburbs versus city, office versus factory, universities versus McDonald's. But none of these worlds is any more real than any other. Real is one of those big, bland, vague words that seems powerful, but is actually utterly lacking in descriptive value. The idea that the inhabitants of the city are less real than the inhabitants of the suburbs or that university professors are less real than the manager of McDonald's is not a penetrating critical insight. When people declare their citizenship in the real world, which, by the way, always involves denying someone else's, they are generally using the word real as a euphemism for gritty. Drawing on the hollowest rhetoric of the 1960s, they are declaring that one can write with authority only if one has come from a background which is socially disadvantaged enough. The real world argument has distant cousins like your grandmother was not a factory worker or you are writing from a position of privilege. The idea that facts of this kind are in and of themselves enough to disqualify someone from writing has spread from academia into the culture at large. Another form of intolerance uh, breathes life into words like the backlash. So even Betty Friedan is classified by Susan Faludi as part of the backlash because since she's written The Feminine Mystique, she hasn't been towing the party line. These kind of words force a confrontation. They offer us a choice. Embrace the article or book in question as truth or dismiss it entirely. 
In an age of fast foods and microwave ovens, it seems natural enough to reach for the equivalent for ideas. It's tempting, convenient really, to glance at an article and immediately categorize it as ours or theirs without bothering to think it through. But nothing interesting can come out of cultural discussions that are right against wrong, as appealing as they seem. They satisfy us, like watching war footage or sports. There's no doubt that it is somehow reassuring and maybe more entertaining to watch the forces of darkness battle the forces of light without any twinges of doubt about which are which. But tolerating dissent is about sustaining that doubt, keeping it alive long enough to come to one's own conclusions. Intolerance of dissent disguises itself most convincingly in an argument that a book like mine might, quote, fall into the wrong hands. Countless people have raised the concern that my book would be, quote, used by the enemy. This anxiety is based on the assumption that the Rush Limbos and Ronald Reagans and Pat Buchanans of the world need a book like mine to justify their ways. They don't. No matter how much we might like to, we can't control what the enemy reads. We can't control how the enemy interprets what it reads. The enemy has lots and lots of in information available to it, but then again, so do we. Well, people say, the enemy doesn't read for ambiguities. The enemy reads for simple messages. But perhaps this assumption about the enemy con conceals an admission about ourselves. Very few of us are reading for anything other than absolutes. It seems to me that we need to worry less about the enemy and more about ourselves and our own ability to read and consume ideas that are not ours. The real enemy, as far as I am concerned, is that which inspires us to be quiet, cautious, and acceptable. The lethal belief that we should not publicly think or analyze or question our assumptions is the contemporary version of what people said to Philip Roth. He shouldn't publish his novels about Jewish families, no matter how good they were, no matter how many glints of truth people saw in them, because they were, quote, bad for the Jews. But what is bad for the Jews, or for women, or for the culture at large, is if we have reached a point where people are not supposed to express their views. If feminism is going to be a vital movement, then it's going to have to be able to sustain critique. Not just critiques like, we should be able to wear lipstick, but critiques that are unsettling, critiques that shake us. By definition, true dissent is disturbing, uncomfortable. It is precisely what we don't want to hear. But without it, we can never get to a place where our exchange of insults becomes an exchange of ideas. I don't think there's anything particularly outrageous in the pages of my book, anything worthy of the fury it inspired but it happened to fall into a cultural discussion that, aside from the lone dissenting voice of Camille Paglia, was not really a discussion at all. On issues like sexual harassment and date rape, there has been one accepted position in the mainstream media over the past few years, recycled and given back to us again and again in slightly different forms. We have to see our way past the rules of discussion. We have to invent ways to talk about politics and sex and responsibility that allow for independence of thought. We should owe allegiance only to what is vivid, original, and interesting. We should owe allegiance only to what feels true. As the conversation opens up to more and varied voices, I hope there will be room for the jostling of ideas, for nuances and complexities, for speculations and ruminations, not just for the sound and the fury. Thank you. And now, Professor Barbara Johnson. I agree that we are a culture that doesn't easily tolerate dissent, but I find that the phrase tolerating dissent is itself in some ways oxymoronic. That is, 
to tolerate dissent in some ways is already to blunt it or to uh, start toward a consensus on principle rather than uh, to have the intolerance of dissent be a sign that there is dissent. In other words, when does dissent begin and end and when does um, toleration begin and end? Is it uh, a division that can be made between sound and fury on the one hand and reasoned discourse on the other? Is that, is that what tolerating dissent would be, that there would be a format of debate and that, um, that disagreeing would be possible because it would not be in the form of absolute rejections or absolute uh, acceptances and them and us rhetoric. And I, I certainly think that the them and us rhetoric is a way of avoiding facing the hard issues involved in any attempt to deal especially with sexuality and sexual life and the power uh, in uh, the power relations that are sometimes mediated through sexuality. So l let me just start by saying that, uh, the, let me just ask you one question. Was it you or the publisher that decided to change the subtitle of the book? Um, the publisher. The, because the original publication was, so the subtitle was Sex, Fear, and Feminism on Campus. And in the paperback version, it is merely sex, fear, and feminism. And I think that the campus as a setting for the thoughts and the observations is an important part of the study and the analysis. Because if sexuality, and particularly female sexuality, is an issue, uh, it is certainly partly always going to be a complicated issue within institutions that have as their um, as their uh, clientele, uh, adolescent women. But the book begins by saying old feminism or good feminism was a feminism that brought about sexual freedom, that, that released women from their uh, subjection to the climate of virtue and the constraints of innocence, and thus old feminism was what freed women to say yes. But now, the new feminism seems to be training women that somehow they should uh, learn to say no, or that, it, which is in a way what you're saying, and I'll, I'll say more about that. The other way of looking at that is that the new feminism says that the, um, the freedom to say yes can only be real if there is the freedom to say no, or in other words, if women are setting or at least participating in the setting of the conditions of their own pleasure. It seems to me that the freedom to say no is just as important as the freedom to say yes, but that still implies that women's freedom is a response rather than an initiation of a sexual encounter or a sexual life, that is, women's desire or female desire seems to be eclipsed in both the question of yes and the question of no when it's phrased in that way. It seems to me that the, the smart reading in the book is to say that in attempting to uh, ensure that some of the ways in which women are oppressed um, don't happen, that is, women have the right to, to complain about uh, sexual victimization where perhaps earlier they only could uh, feel bad about themselves or take it, that that inevitably seems to lead to a moment where the very rhetoric of the manuals about how to deal with date rape or rape and sexual violence in general, those, the rhetoric of those manuals are reconstructing an image of women's sexuality which is not freeing but rather confining, that is, repeating the construction of women's sexuality as innocence and as always resistant, never initiating sexual acts. And it seems to me that is, in a way, a smart reading of the way the rhetoric constructs an image of women. That is, in the very attempt to show 
that sexual violence might be an issue and that women have to be uh, able to feel empowered to deal with that, in the, very, in the very act of describing this, a, an image of women is a kind of byproduct, that is, that women are in fact victims. But it seems to me that the, the position of women, of, of victim, is easy to find oneself in, especially in moments where the agency of victimization is in some way a cultural climate. That is, if Katie Royfe is saying that the cultural climate of the date rape culture is constructing, is victimizing women in a way, again, by showing that, by seeing them as innocent and resistant to sexuality, then it's also true that the way the book begins saying, I have been silenced, uh, dissent has not been tolerated, I have learned to be silent, is acting out some of the same gestures of uh, proclaimed victimization, and that, that uh, therefore it's not so easy to get away from the dialectic of silencing and speaking, or of uh, seeing the intolerance of others, or the, the uh, violence and power of others as a form of silencing. I think the, the thing that I would, that the, the question of how women are construct, how women's sexuality is seen through these manuals or these um, guidelines, I think is, is an image that I would agree with. That is, I would agree that it needs to be rethought, that it's really not liberating to think that women are mere, um, mere non-sexual beings or innocent beings, I think. The question is how the uh, expression of women's sexuality can be uh, freed. And I think there, the image of feminism as only consisting of saying no, seeing sex as bad and violent and so, and so forth, is an oversimplification of the debates within feminism. That is, there really is dissent within feminism. And, Catherine McKinnon is definitely an object of a lot of arguments within feminism. Uh, the, the, it seems to me the big contradiction in McKinnon's work is, on the one hand, she posits that there is a powerful patriarchal system which holds women in a disempowered position, in part through constructed images of the sexiness of violence. But on the other hand, she's willing to hand over to the government the power to censor. So how is it that this same government or the power structure that empowers the government is going to flip over and stop being the disempowering force and the censoring force that she proclaims it to be? It seems to me that giving any power structure the right to censor would be playing right into the structure of power that she's trying to contradict. Um, and it seems to me that the the, the way in which she justifies the existence of, or the, um, the desirability of censorship is uh, a contradiction of her mistrust of power structures. But the way in which the date rape culture, or even McKinnon, has arisen has been an analysis of how cultural power works, and it works in part through the uh, effect of representations on people's lives, as if representations themselves have agency to determine uh, people's behavior. And the disagreement within feminism has always been around what uh, to do about that. Can censorship be a way of changing cultural representations, or do uh, representations actually have that direct a relation between uh, life and, um, and culture? The final point I'd like to make, so the, second, the first point was, it's a good reading to say that inadvertently almost, the date rape culture has constructed an image of women as victim that is 
uh, in some ways confining. Second point is that, uh, in a way, that argument already exists within feminism, and that the unanimity of feminism that seem that you seem to have encountered, I think, doesn't correspond to uh, the full range of debates that have already taken that are taking place within feminism. And the third point I'd like to make is that, in some ways, implicitly. By saying that women are wrong to feel violated or that such a reaction to uh, a date rape situation is inadequate, that they should just grit their teeth and chin up and brazen it out, uh, implies that it's women who have to adjust or change. That is, that uh, nothing needs to be critiqued in the way power functions or the way sexuality uh, works through acculturation, but rather that, once again, women adjust to whatever happens to them. Women learn to uh, take it. Women become strong by simply learning to take it. And so uh, that seems, in a way, like as old-fashioned as the image of women as victims. It seems to me that there is room for a critique, and yet that the construction of women as victims is ultimately not doing justice to the issues of uh, freedom that feminism existed to raise. Thanks. Um, I'm, I'm going to try to respond quickly so we can also have audience questions. Um, first of all, um, the, the change in the, in the subtitle uh, from se fear, sex, sex, fear, and feminism on campus to sex, fear, and feminism, um, which is not my choice or, or have anything I ever had anything to do with. But the rationale behind that, if you were curious, was that so many people were writing in saying, you know, this is exactly like what I felt at my office. And, you know, firemen saying, like, you know, we had just had this big thing over sexual harassment, and could we have pictures of our girlfriends half naked? And this is what I was thinking. And, I lo and so that enough people from enough, you know, I kind of wrote this thing, and I said, here's what I saw. And I wrote it very explicitly saying, you know, this is from the campus and on the campus, and this is what I think. But that it's, it ha other people saw in it enough from their experience that, the publishers felt that this was actually a book which wasn't just about campuses. Um, and as, as for the question of unity, um, you know, and, and I'm not meaning, you know, and the reason that I say in the beginning of the book, um, I wrote the book out of the belief that some feminisms are better than others, is that, you know, clearly I'm not, I'm not trying to imply, I mean, for the sake of argument, one has to talk about feminism. And if you had that S on the end every time you mentioned it, it would be incredibly annoying to read. But um, I, I do think that why my book, I mean, and, and you know, you do think about this, when I, when I said that question, you know, why should I get all these hundreds and hundreds of letters from men saying, you know, I'm grateful for you for saying all men aren't potential rapists. I mean, you know, this is weird, right? Because, I mean, here we are, I've said this thing that is the most banal statement in the world, and yet, this statement, enough people feel that, you know, actually, this is something that needs to be said, and that, that's, that to me is a sign of you know a certain amount of intolerance, so that it's really only Camille Paglia kind of, you know, screaming and yelling and waving her arms around on stages and talking really really quickly, um, <laughs> and you know it's the thing about that is you know and and is is that there has been a problem. I mean clearly the reason that my book got so many people so mad and, and what people said to me all the time about the book and you know this is of course a mixed compliment. Uh, you know, your book started this huge fight at my dinner party, or I, you know, I broke up with my boyfriend over your book. You know, this is the kind of thing where, you know, what and what that tells me is that there hasn't been a whole lot of open discussion on this. I mean, it's something about it, and I really don't, you know, you'd like to think it's the book I wrote and my complicated analysis of dating rituals on campuses, but no, it isn't. It's actually the fact that we haven't been, in, and again, this isn't, you know, part of this is mainstream media. I mean, this hasn't been in the mainstream media, you know, and, and I don't, I would never say I was silenced. Um, you know, one of the things that I object to is the kind of Princeton student, get, student getting up at a microphone and saying, I have been silenced, because I actually feel like she's not 
society's silenced. You know, she's not society's disenfranchised. And that, you know, all I'm trying to say is I was kind of pathetic. I was an adolescent conformist who wanted to dress like everybody else in Adam's house. And you can see I still dress like everybody else in Adam's house. <laughs> and um, I still, to this day, I'm still, I'm still trying. So, so, you know, this is conformism. Um, so, you know, my own fault, certainly. But still, I mean, there is something weird about the fact that those take back the night marches year by year after year. They go, you know, two, four, six, eight, no more date, rape, women unite, take back the night, candles and drum beats and this and that. And I don't, rem I don't remember anybody feeling that they could say out loud to anybody else, you know, God, I think this is weird. You know, and I mean, to a certain extent, I really, I felt that way. Now, that is changing, you know, and, and when I go and get talk on campuses, people come up to me and sometimes if I'm at a place like Brown, they won't do it publicly. I mean, this will be very furtive and they'll say, you know, I'm really so glad you said this because I've been thinking this for so long and I never felt like it was okay to say these things. So that, that's, that's that first part. Um, and the second part of what you were saying, which is a kind of, you know, which, which I think is a lack of clarity on my part. Um, is, is not, I'm not saying to women, you know, grit your teeth, like, okay, so he forced you to have sex with him, who cares? I'm not, I'm really not saying that. Um, I'm really not. What I am saying partially um, is that we have to separate bad sexual experiences from rape and that actually, you know, if you had too many drinks and you slept with somebody and you're, you know, that, that question, we'll look at that one in four question where it's, have you had sex with someone you didn't want to because the man gave you drugs or alcohol? Now, my point is what's wrong with us that we're not deciding to have that drink? I mean, that, you know, and how many of us have, it's that passive tense, which is incredibly seductive. You know, it's inc and, I, and I will admit, I'll be the first to admit, I talked for the, all my years at Harvard, now I'm reliving them. Um, I talked about my life in the passive tense. You know, this thing happened to me last night and it's incredibly appealing. And here's this political ideology that says to us, okay, you feel miserable the next morning? Well, maybe that was rape. You know, and it's appealing. It's compelling. Um, but I think it's dangerous. And I think that we can't say, you know, if you've had too many drinks, so you, ha you both got drunk, you're a man or a woman, you know, lots of us have done things we regret uh, and things that we feel miserable about. And I'm not meaning to, you know, and, and, and in all honesty, I'm not meaning to be glib about this. In all honesty, people have very painful, miserable sexual experiences. And those are bad sexual experiences, but that's not rape. Because once we say that's rape, then that means that there's a rapist. Um, you know, and recently there was a case at University of, at Pomona University, where um, they have an explicit consent rule. So a woman had sex with a man, sophomore year, they're both drunk. She didn't say no. She never said no. She didn't say yes, but she didn't say no. She just, they were drunk and they fell into bed together. They were friends um, for the next two years. Her senior year, she decided that this thing that had happened to her sophomore year was rape. And she brought him up on charges. This was gone, went on his record. He was suspended, nearly expelled. You know, the whole university system was, you know, kind of drawn into this. Um, you know, and this is going to be on his record for the rest of his life. Now, um, the problem with that is that, you know, she didn't say no. And, you know, this is, this is one of those things where, I mean, we can say this is terrible that this happened to you. And I read this woman's nine-page, single-spaced report of this evening. And, you know, it is terrible. But... Um, it's not rape, and, and I think that, that that maintaining, you know, this is partially a use of language. I mean, I think it actually is dangerous once we start using the word rape to apply to all these things because, you know, we end up trivializing the word. It's drained of its meaning. Um, you know, and it turns out that, you know, this, this, I think it ends up trivializing the serious violent crime of rape uh, once we use it in that way. Also about sex, and back to what I was saying before, and, th and then I'm going to end this answer, long-winded answer. Um, we, we, I think that, that when I talk about this, here's this set of rules. Here's this political framework which says, okay, you feel, you feel uncomfortable. That's a big buzzword. You feel uncomfortable. Well, maybe that was sexual harassment. You feel miserable the next day. Well, maybe that was rape. That that kind of political framework is dangerous because it gives us a way to make sense out of a confusion and ambivalence about sex. And I think this is particularly, and I talk about this a little in the book, a particularly confusing sexual climate that we're living in right now. Um, and it gives us this way to make sense of that. And, but, the, but the thing that's missing from that is that men are confused too. And you know, every time I go talk on campuses, some 18-year-old boy raises him and he says, um, well, you know, what should we do? How should we ask someone on a date? Like, what do we do? You know, and the truth is that 
And, and I think this is what's dangerous about this that are all men are potential rapists, is that when you look at those 17-year-olds, they are scared and they don't know what to do and they're kind of confused and some of them are pretty sophisticated and know exactly what they're doing, but most of them don't. Um, and, 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 you know, when, when we, this, this, that's why I look, you know, we look at that, that date rape film and I think it's employing these stereotypes and these myths of what a man is and what a woman is that aren't true because really the missing thing there is that those men are feeling all sorts of pressures and all sorts of anxieties and ambivalences that you know, they're also subject to. So, audience questions, comments? Somebody's got a question. You wanna? State the rules, okay. Okay. you need to come. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, you know, we do we need, need rules here uh, too. And uh, if you could come, there are two microphones here in, uh, on either side and if you could come and um, uh, please identify yourself and ask a short, paralyzing question. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yes. Hi, my name is um, Andre. I'm an undergraduate. And I was just curious um, as to what your definition of rape is. You haven't really <laughs> told us yet. And um, I guess my question in terms of that would be, do you think that rape is possible under a marriage contract in a marriage? OK. Um, I, yes, I do think rape is possible under a marriage contract. Um, I define rape, which is you know, pretty much in most states the legal definition of rape, which is the use of physical force, the threat of physical force, or sex with someone who's incapacitated. Now, incapacitated means they're passed out, you know, or they're, you know, does not mean they've had two drinks. Uh, so that's, that's my definition. Okay, and also I wanted to say really quick, um, I was sort of amazed, because it seems like you and Barbara Johnson to some extent agree. So I'm not sure how, how to reconcile that, but it seems like you agree. And she may be more amazed. Um. <laughs> <laughs> but other than that, that's it. Thank you. OK. Well, we agree. We partially agree, and we partially don't agree, I think, is the, OK. Um, y oh, yes. Oh, sure. um, my name is John Cook, and I'm a man, but I'm not a potential rapist. Um, <laughs> Thank you for uh, speaking here tonight. I wanted to ask um, about a topic that's probably been over-discussed, but the Clarence Thomas and Anita Hill uh, situation from a few years ago. Um, I kind of feel that that's unleashed um, some of the cultural feeling that we've had, um, some of the, del the delicacy of women issue, the um, sort of quick to take, the feeling that of people that are quick to take offense. Um, do you think that kind of turned out to be a a cultural primer for like, um, the mass media in uh, sexual harassment uh, issues? Yeah, certainly it did. Um, what are the, I, I think it's kind of a. What do you think? You tell me what you think. <laughs> this is one of those questions. You tell me what you think, <laughs> then I'll tell you what I think. <laughs> well. It seems that um, there wasn't the best uh, foundation on which to have an argument about sexual harassment. It was something that happened 10 years ago. It was something that was vague. There, it was something that uh, was not addressed at the time. Mm -hmm. But um, by Anita, Anita Hill becoming sort of enthroned as the, the, as the queen of the way to do this, mm -hmm. I think it was dangerous that um, something that uh, might have <coughs> kind of slipped by in a discussion five years ago suddenly resurfaced and said, oh my gosh, I've been mm -hmm. sexually harassed. Um, mm -hmm. So. Well, ooh, um, I'm sorry I did this to you. It's my fault. Um, OK. Uh, you know, it's one of those things where you don't know, we don't know, really, what happened between Anita Hill and Clarence Thomas. And, you know, this, this always comes up with these sort of he said, she said things. You know, people always say, like, well, what do you think about William Kennedy Smith? And the truth is, I don't know, I wasn't there. You know, and this is why we have a legal system, you know. So you're, you're right. I mean, I think in a certain way, of course, this is the only way we can talk, you know, we can't sort of deliberate about abstract legal questions in the media. So we need, you know, the sort of beautiful woman to go on television and say, this is what happened to me, and we need the drama uh, in order to talk about it. Um, I think the danger with Anita Hill is that she became kind of a heroine. I mean, to me, um, that she, you know, and, and, I, and I read this story about um, an eight-year-old girl who had been listening to the hearings with her mother, and she realized that she'd been sexually harassed because two boys at her in her playground had said to her, I want to hump you. 
and she realized this is sexual harassment. And, and you know, again, this is what I was talking about before, you know, where we're teaching um, five-year-olds now and fourth graders, you know, about sexual harassment in public school curriculums. And, and I do think that that, you know, I wouldn't want that to be my daughter to think, you know, this is the way you deal with, you know, if, if, the, boy, if the little boys say that they want to hump you, then, then that sexual harassment you should go get the principal, you know, and probably like call in the federal, you know, call, set federal investigations in motion, which actually did happen with a seven-year-old. Um, but what, but I mean, again, about Anita Hill is I think that, uh, you know, a, a lot of things came, came out of those hearings that, and some of them were good and some of them weren't good. I mean, I think the good thing that did come out of those hearings was that suddenly there was this visual image in people's living rooms where they saw uh, very vividly, this is the number of men in our government. You know, and all of a sudden it was like, wait a minute, there's only, you know, there's this one woman and all these men. And that, that you know, for some reason, and this is a, you know, a sort of depressing thing for, I think, is the power of television. I mean, this is the power of television. And suddenly people were like, you know, we've got to elect women into our, you know, we forgot, we realize now we have to elect <laughs> women to, into the Senate and the Hearts. And, and, you know, that's good. So I think, um, you know, and, and I think, you know, it, you know, all that, the sort of hyper paranoia and the lists, you know, you go into certain corporations and you see these lists in the bathroom of things you are not supposed to say to your coworkers and things like this, which are very ominous and I think certainly come from that. Um, but, you know, it was going to happen sooner. You know, if it wasn't Anita Hill and Clarence Thomas, it was going to be somebody else because, you know, like these, th you know, it's really not, Anita Hill didn't start anything. It's like people are feeling this sort of need for sexual rules and this, you know, a, the whole kind of chemistry was right and, you know, it, it would have been somebody else. So, yes. Hi, I'm an alum of, of the Kennedy School, and I also work um, at the state office for crime victims, um, not just sexual assault victims, but all victims. And I, I have a, a lot of responses, but I'll limit it to just a couple comments. Um, the, the comment about all men being rapists, um, I think that, that it obviously has been said, but it is on the radical fringe, and it's not what a lot of people have been putting forth. However, um, in the victims' rights movement, if, if you look around, it is all women doing all the work, the violence prevention work, um, all, all of the, the activism work. So you sort of say, well, where are men in, in this picture? And what are they doing to stop the violence, not just against women, but also against men? Um, the other point I want to make about your book, and the, um, which I have read about the, the, what, what you talked about, about ideas and censoring ideas and, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a cold. <clears throat> but um, I, I think your book did raise a lot of points that needed to be aired. What I didn't like about your book was your tone and your sort of really, what I considered a kind of flip attitude um, towards victimization and what really does happen to people. I can't tell you the, the hours that I have spent on the phone with people um, after your book came out, talking to them, you know, about, you know, not that it doesn't invalidate what happened to you, and because from, I'm in a media clips this high about, you know, pr praising your book. I mean, you, you talked about the media criticism of your book. There's, there was quite a bit of media coverage that was very favorable and sort of said, oh, yes, well, well let's get back to reality now and, and let's just, okay, this is what happens in rape. It's not that big of a problem anymore where people are going forward in the, in the criminal justice process, um, it just seemed to me that it was a little bit disrespectful of uh, what people's you know, really difficult experiences in going forward. It's not very easy to do. And um, I just think that, that part of the whole discussion was unfortunate. And it's very easy to sort of sit in Harvard and talk about the intellectual aspects of feminism and this, that, the other thing. But, there are real people on the other end of it who mm -hmm. it does affect. It's not just date rape. It's all spans of rape and sexual abuse. It's, this is right. not the, well, the kind of backlash discussions are not just limited to rape. But I guess that was just OK, let, let, let me let me respond to that. Um, and, you know, I certainly don't mean to be disrespectful um, of people's pain and of, of people who've been victims of violent crime. Um, and, I, and I think I'm very clear in the book, and this is really all you can do, 
Um, and that is, you know, I'm very clear about what I'm writing about and who I'm writing about and who I am and what I've seen so that I haven't seen what you've seen. And that all I can do is say, you know, and, and I read you that, that thing where I say, you know, I've written what I see limited, personal, but entirely real. I mean, I'm really writing about the way that we're talking about these things, the images we're using. And I'm not writing about, you know, what's going on, you know, in a, in a rape crisis center anywhere. I mean, and I'm very, I think all you can do is say, be honest and say, this is what I am writing about and this is what I'm not writing about. Now, to the other part of your question, I, I would say, um, I've done a lot of talking with Linda Fairstein. Uh, do you know who she is? Okay, for people who don't know, um, she was the woman lawyer who's, she's now head of the Manhattan Sex Crimes Unit. Um, and she was the lawyer who prosecuted the Central Park rape trial, uh, which most people will remember. And she, you know, when you see a blonde woman lawyer in a movie prosecuting rape, it's based on Linda Fairstein. I mean, she sort of, she's written a book called Sexual Violence, which is about um, her experience working with rape. And we've done a lot of talking together, and what's been really interesting is that she's said to me, you know, she totally agrees with everything in my book. Now, what's, what's interesting about this is that she said to me, you know, actually, all of this stuff where we're muddying the definition of rape is actually making it harder in a legal setting to prosecute rape. And that, you know, I, and I, I was with her, we had this interview, and the interviewer said, well, you know, I had this experience once where a man I, he was bigger than me. I didn't say no, but he was really, I felt he was bigger than me, and I sort of felt like it was, you know, rape, but I, I didn't say no. And Linda, Lin, I didn't say anything, but Linda said to this woman, you know, that was not rape. And, you know, that kind of thinking is making it difficult to actually prosecute rape. And if you read the rapes in, that Linda Fairstein talks about, you know, there, this, is vi this is a very violent crime, and I agree with you, this is a horrible violent crime. You know, and, and every time, every rape she talks about involves violence. It's not one of these things where, you know, I had a few drinks and I didn't say no and I didn't say yes and I woke up the next morning and that she was saying, you know, this, this kind of expanding definition makes it much more difficult to prosecute rape. So that's, that's my answer. Okay. Thanks. I'm Kathy Richmond. I'm in uh, Romance Languages and Literature as a graduate student and I'm lucky not to have classmates like yours. We seem to have a lot more room for discussion than you seem to have had at Princeton. And I've been thinking about how to address my question to you, uh, and I think it has to be about, um, in a way, institutional forces. And I think when you talk about silencing, there seems to be some kind of silencing that threatens you and other kinds that threaten other people. So I think that, that it's a very telling change, the change in the title of your book. So because people wrote in and it seemed to touch a chord, even though you wrote it about on campus, it's now taken as in the greater society. And you felt moved by people who had written to you, but that seems to be a more acceptable um, response to you than people who um, would criticize. You had talked about some other bunch of letter writing that didn't sound all right. It was hysteria and mass media uh, hype. And I, I guess my real question to you is, if you don't respond to institutional silencing forces, what happens? And the, and the reason it strikes me now is that I thought, I was curious to see your reaction to your host's, what I took as dismissive, um, introduction of your thesis title. And I, I may be touchy being in literature, but it seemed to me that, poo poo, that was quite a title for literature. So I bring in three things at the same time. Um, okay, um, <laughs> your first question, I think I heard two questions. One is institutional silencing, right? Um, and can you, can you explain a little more what you mean by institutional silencing? Well, in a, in a sense, I think that the publishing industry is a large institution. Mm -hmm. And you have, I, I know that authors do oh, okay. have a limited right to say what they do and don't want, but it strikes me as funny in a way that when Barbara Johnson first asked you about it, you said, no, that wasn't my decision, it was the publisher. Right. Okay. Um, sort of, okay, this, this, this is again, I mean, to a certain extent, this is a question about, you know, you're a young writer and what, you know, how much control do you have in the world? And the answer is really little, mm -hmm. okay? And um, if you should, I, I would also say you should see the cover of the British edition of my book, which has a naked woman on the cover of it, which I did not, I don't mind now, but I'm used to, but did certainly probably wouldn't have consented to because I think it, it complicated the issue um, somewhat. But, uh, <laughs> um, 
But, you know, if I had very much objected to them changing the subtitle, I would have said, um, I mean, I didn't do it because I don't, I don't even notice things like this. Um, but if I would very much objected to it, I would have said, you can't do it, and they wouldn't have done it um, at that point. Um, so, you know, from my point of view, I think, and, and this, is, this is, again, one of those things where when I was writing the book as a graduate student in English, in Princeton, you know, at my computer, it really did mean something different than it meant when it, once it was out in the world. And I really did have no idea of what this was going to sort of be used as and mean and, and all of that. Um, and, I, and I do think that some of the, and you know, I, I do think that some of the questions that I'm raising are just about campuses, but that some of these questions are about the way we're talking about men and women in the media at large and, you know, outside of feminism. So. You know, in my new introduction, certainly, which is what the paperback is, certainly was an effort to kind of broaden that out and to talk about, you know, these larger things. Um, now, for the other rest part of your question. Um, well, you know, I, I don't know. Maybe. Um, I just worried that you might, in a way, be the, uh, I forget the adjective you used, but the something hostess that was. Hypocritical hostess. Oh, right. <laughs> God. Um, I think I probably. I, I, I certainly was raised to be a hypocritical hostess, um, and no, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm very, I'm, I, you know, I just, I just defended my PhD, so it's still sort of, you know, this thing which is, I barely conceive of as, as out in the world, and, and I'm, you know, I, I, I sort of think a certain amount of teasing about these things is, is all right, you know, we'll, we'll see when the book comes out. Maybe I'll change the subtitle now. Um, Don't. <laughs> thank you. Hi, uh, Hi, my name is Moon Dutton, and I'm an undergraduate. And I just wanted to say first that I liked a lot of your points, and I thought you spoke well. My question has to do with um, the fact that you referred a few times to the feminists in the third person, and I found that a little odd. I'm, I know you've been referred to by some people as a, a doomy feminist, and whether or not you like that moniker, uh, my question is whether you see your images of, of strong and powerful women as maybe being part of feminism. Maybe you see the feminism you grew up with as being broad and pluralistic enough to encompass what you have to say, and maybe you wouldn't want to boil that down to just the date rape movement you seem oh, to have yeah. equated it with. Okay, let, let me, I, then I, I haven't been clear enough here then. Because um, I do certainly consider myself a feminist. Um, and I think it's possible to say there are, th there are a lot of things in the feminism that I saw around me that I did not identify with. You know, and certainly feminism is having trouble, you know, we sort of hear this all the time. There are, younger women aren't wanting to identify themselves as feminists. I think some of these, are, these reasons are why. Um, but, uh, you know, I do think of myself as a feminist. And I do think that, that there is a kind of feminism which I can imagine. And I think that, you know, that do me feminist article, which has certainly, you know, haunted me, um, is is actually, you know, what he was getting at in that article was, you know, and he was writing, this was an article, a cover story in Esquire magazine, which um, Anna Quinlan, among other, many other people, have been objecting to. Um, and this article, what he was saying was that feminists, you know, there can be this sort of strong pro-sex strain of feminism, which is not about women as victims and is not about, you know, a kind of shrinking violet image of, of feminism. And I, and I do think that that can, you know, that, that there's certainly things are starting to change. And one of the things that I guess I haven't quite talked about is that from when I first started writing this book to now, I do feel like things have changed um, you know, for a whole number of different reasons, that suddenly um, it is easier to come out and talk about these things, you know, and that, it's, it, that there is starting to be more discussion and more dissent, and there is starting to be a sort of what I think is a, is a, is a different vision of what, of what feminism can be. Mm -hmm. But how much of the feminism you talk about is the date rape movement, and how much is all the rest of it? What do you, what do you, I mean, the date rape movement as feminism, mm -hmm. do you think that you've maybe made that? Well, no, no, no. I'm ta what I was talking about, which is not just date rape movement, but also has to do with a certain interest in sexual harassment. It also has to do with Susan Faludi's formulation of the backlash against women. It also has to do with Naomi Wolf's um, you know, Vogue magazine is making us anorexic. I mean, it, it's a whole strain of feminism, which, I mean, now Naomi's changed her mind somewhat from this. But um, so, uh, you know, so, so that I'm talking about a certain kind, you know, it's Gloria Steinem's revolution from within. I mean, I'm talking about what, when we think of feminism in the mainstream, this is what we think of. Uh, so, you know, I'm not, I'm not just talking about, you know, date, the date rape issue as what I'm objecting to. 
Hi, my Hi. name is Maria. I'm an undergraduate also. Um, <laughs> first, I'd like to thank you for writing your book because when I read it, I was like, wow, someone thinks like me. And I always thought it was kind of wrong for me to think that way. Like, it's a conflict of interest because I am a woman to think these things. So first, I'd like to thank you for that. Um, my question is directed to Professor Johnson. I just want to know what her reaction is to the statistics you mentioned about 7.8% of the women in the United States or the world um, would be the only ones not experiencing some form of sexual harassment or attack. Or Good question. Go ahead. Do you think that this is exaggerated or? Do you agree with her definition of what date rape would include and would not include? Or would you say that it was a broader and more blurry line? Thank you. Hi. Hi. We, we actually only have time, I think, for two more questions. Two more? OK. Yeah, go ahead. I made it. Um, my name's Kylie. I'm a student here at the Kennedy School. And uh, my question involves the fact that you seem to take a lot of issues out of context, that um, if a woman feels violated by a man, she should sort of stand up to him and take the matter into her own hands and exact justice. And uh, I would say, in a lot of cases, that really might not be possible. And it's not the woman portraying herself as a victim, but what if the person who is violating her is her boss or her professor? And I would say, in these cases, you do need a legal framework, which you seem to mock somewhat. And I agree the sexual harassment policies can sometimes seem a little absurd with words like ogling or ogling and who really knows what those are. But I think that there really is a need for them. Um, and you brought okay. up a situation of a sort of a five-year-old girl on a bus, I believe it was, who should be able to stand up to those boys and really fight back to them. And I would say, well, that's sort of ignoring all the messages she's getting from society that really the last thing she should be doing as a five-year-old girl is standing up to those boys. So I would just ask, okay. how do you decontextualize? How okay. do you justify um, that? The 
thing is that, you know, you say, well, the messages she's getting from society, you know, are telling her that she can't, you know, t talk back to those boys. But, but um, I would be worried that if we say to her, if we sort of say to her, you know, this is sexual harassment, I mean, that, that, that the message that we are then sending her is, you can't take care of yourself. And, and there's a, what I think the danger with some of these rules, and I certainly would agree with you, um, that we don't want, I mean, I, I'm not saying that we should not have such a thing called sexual harassment, okay, and that there is no such thing as abuses of power, because clearly, if a professor, if a boss is abusing power in a certain way, then that should be counted as sexual harassment. I, I would certainly agree with that. But I think the problem with these excessive definitions, as well as, you know, classifying, say, you know, the, the kids' schoolyard chant as sexual harassment is dangerous for two reasons. Well, first of all, which we won't even go into, which is a free speech question, um, but, se you know, which has been coming up a lot, especially on universities. But second of all is, um, you know, to me, the danger is that we can institutionalize the idea that women are passive and vulnerable. Um, and that the danger is, you know, I mean, that, that kids are very nasty to each other. You know, all little children are incredibly nasty to each other. And they say horrible, nasty things to each other all the time. And, and you know, it's not just uh, the boys saying nasty things to girls. I mean, and girls are nasty to each other. Girls are incredible. I think girls are incredibly nasty to each other. Um, but that this shouldn't be, this shouldn't be, um, we should not then say, this sexual speech, the little boy saying, I want to hump you. I mean, these are little boys. This is other five-year-old boys, two five-year-old boys, other five-year-old boys on her school bus. I mean, this is not, you know, a whole gang of big, threatening guys. I mean, these are little kids who say this to her. What is it that I, I wouldn't want her to feel like she's got this kind of special vulnerability, especially at the age of five, you know, and that somehow she can't turn around and say something back to them. Now, I'm not saying... Um, all women under all circumstances should stand up for themselves. Uh, you know, I certainly would never say that. You know, I mean, and, and in fact, um, you know, this, this isn't even, you know, I'm certainly, I can't, you know, there are plenty of times where you don't stand up for yourself, uh, you know, or you can't, or you don't, or you, you know, find it difficult or, and all of that. I mean, that's true. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about what are the consequences of putting, making rules, like the Antioch rules say, or laws, you know, that, that, then, you know, make this into what we are. Um, you know, and there's certainly women who, there are feminist legal scholars who said we shouldn't have a special category called sexual harassment, that it should all be harassment. Um, there are definitely, I mean, obviously we've got trouble. We're still working through this. Hostile or offensive work environment is clearly not specific enough. You know, what does this mean? What can this mean? I mean, this is something that we, we obviously are still groping around and haven't, you know, as I am not a legal scholar, I can't really, you know, I don't know the best way to do it. I mean, certainly, though, I do believe harassment exists. I just think that we have to separate what's, what's sexuality or what's flirtation or what's, you know, bad behavior from, you know, sexual harassment. So you're not against sexual harassment policies in general. You're against it going too far in your definition of too far? Is right. that correct? Okay. Thanks. Hi, I'm Hi. Cheryl, and I'm an undergrad, and I was wondering how you feel about finals clubs. Ooh. Um, <laughs> suddenly I was like, I barely finals can clubs. remember final clubs. Um, um, huh. I never, I never went to finals clubs. This actually was an issue because this was, a, this was actually a feminist issue of the day, I think. Um, but I've never, <laughs> I've never been to finals clubs. Um, and I, I, I guess, you know, I don't object to finals clubs on the point necessarily just because of women. You know, I also think that, fi I think finals clubs are a sort of disgusting institution, you know, for all of their exclusionary principles that they represent. I also don't, I can't imagine wanting to go to a party at a finals club. Um, so, which is why this never compelled itself to me as an issue. But, um, you know, so, so at, at Princeton, actually, there was, you know, they have those eating clubs, which is the parallel there. And the a woman just won a case against one of them where she sued that women had to be admitted. Uh, and this was a big thing there. Um, so I don't know. I mean, basically, I think that they should be abolished. <laughs> How about that? Thank you. <laughs> Thank, thanks very much for our two speakers tonight. Thank you again.
you see, I promise not to have any embellishment. And the one thing I did...